Good morning to you all. I'm Renee Francaire with Cabinet Communications and the moderator for today's COVID-19 update. We are joined today by Premier Sandy Silver and Dr. Catherine Elliott, the Acting Chief Medical Officer of Health. Closed captioning is provided by National Closed Captioning. Thank you to Mary Thiessen for providing our ASL interpretation and to André Boussier for providing our French translation. Following the remarks from our speakers, we will go to the media present in the room and then on the phone lines for a round of questions. I will call you by name and you will each have two questions. Before we begin with our speakers, I would like to verify that everyone can hear us. If any of the reporters are having problems, please email ecoinfo at yukon.ca. I will now hand it over to Premier Sandy Silver. Thanks, Renee. I appreciate that. Uh, and good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us here. I'm glad to be here with uh, Dr. Catherine Elliott on the traditional territory of the Kwanlan Dun First Nation and the Ta'an Kwachin Council. Since Friday, November the 5th, we have confirmed more than 115 cases of COVID. Our active case count is over 150. We also have widespread and untraceable community transmission in Whitehorse. This means there is a high risk of COVID-19 exposure throughout the city and increased risk in our rural communities as well. To respond to this unprecedented spike in cases and increased risk of transmission, our government has declared a state of emergency under the Civil Emergency Measures Act. Declaring a state of emergency allows our government to implement new temporary measures that have been recommended by Dr. Elliott to rapidly reduce transmission and ensure our healthcare system is not overwhelmed. These new measures include mandatory masking, limits on personal gatherings, organizing, organized gatherings, seated ticketed events and faith-based and cultural gatherings, and restrictions on restaurants, bars, nightclubs, gyms, uh, fitness studios, and personal services. A more detailed list of measures is available online at yukon.ca. We are urging all Yukoners to follow these new measures immediately. They will be enforced under the Civil Emergency Measures Act as of November the 13th and will be in place and will be in place until at least December the 3rd of this year. By taking these steps now, we hope to be able to stop the rampant transmission that we are currently seeing in the territory. Now, Dr. Elliott and her team will continue to actively assess the COVID-19 risks in the territory and adjust recommendations as necessary. We are also fast tracking the proof of vaccine requirement for designated settings to align with these new recommendations. As of Saturday, November the 13th, you will be required to prove that you are fully vaccinated, two shots, to access a designated setting. The list of designated settings has been finalized and will be available online today at yukon.ca. Now the list is based on the BC model, and we've been saying that for a while, uh, with Yukon specific considerations as recommended by the Chief Medical Officer of Health. For example, proof of vaccination will be required to access personal services, per personal service establishments such as hair salons. Starting on Saturday, people will be required to show on paper or the digital copy of their proof of vaccination credential, as well as a piece of government issued ID uh, to, in order to access these establishments and services that are on the list of designated settings. Now, Yukoners can request their proof of vaccination certification uh, credential uh, online and that's at yukon.ca slash vaccine dash proof. You can also access this service uh, over the phone 
via the COVID-19 info line, and that number is 1-877-374-0425. This line is open seven days a week, 7.30 a.m. to 8 p.m. A Yukon-specific QR code reader app is being developed uh, to support local businesses and organizations to verify vaccination status. This app will securely verify an individual's proof of vaccination credential. It will be available to read any QR code that follows the Government of Canada's specifications for proof of vaccination credentials. Uh, this app uh, will be uh, made available for free on app stores uh, in the coming days. We will be supporting our business communities and others impacted uh, organizations as we implement this requirement. Officials will be hosting information sessions for businesses and organizations on the new app starting this week. I do really want to thank the businesses that have, uh, have already started to adapt these measures uh, and that are working with their clientele to help them adjust. We ask you, Connors, uh, to be patient and respectful of businesses and of organizations as they introduce these new requirements. Please remember that these measures are designed to protect public health and to keep us safe. I also want to provide additional information about the new vaccine requirements for employment that we announced last month. This requirement will apply to all territorial uh, government employees, including teachers and all frontline healthcare workers. It'll also apply to volunteers, including firefighters, uh, volunteer firefighters, uh, and emergency medical services to uh, volunteers, volunteers in government, uh, education, uh, in healthcare settings, uh, and consultations and contractors who routinely work in Yukon government workplaces and environments. As we announced last week, employees will be required to have their first dose of vaccine no later than November the 30th, and their second dose no later than January 30th. This will ensure that employees and frontline healthcare workers that have not yet been immunized have enough time to receive both doses of vaccination before the new requirements come into force. We recognize that there is a very small number of people who are ineligible, or sorry, are eligible for vaccination but cannot do so uh, for specific medical reasons. These individuals will be accommodated. Those employees who do not meet the new vaccine requirements will be placed on leave without pay until they meet the requirements. We are following the recommendations of the Chief Medical Officer of Health and her team as we work, as we work through the implementation of this requirement and our focus remains the protection of the health and safety of Yukoners. We continue to encourage all eligible Yukoners to please get vaccinated. We will continue to provide information about the safety and the efficacy of vaccines. We continue to work with unions to ensure that we provide a workplace that is healthy and safe for our employees and that allows them to continue to safely serve Yukoners. This vaccine requirement also applies to employees in our partner organizations that the government funds to provide services to vulnerable people. Officials will be working directly with those organizations to help them implement these recommendations. We have learned over the past 20 months that following the science and the advice of public health experts is the best way to navigate through the pandemic. We have also learned that COVID-19 is not finished with us, even if we have had enough of it. This vaccine requirement for employment will be in effect until general health and general public health concerns are reduced to a level where workplaces can operate without COVID-19 related restrictions as advised by the Office of the Chief Medical Officer of Health. The vaccine 
remains the best form of protection against COVID-19, and they are also our way out of this pandemic. We know that these new measures are broad and will have significant impact on Yukoners. We need to take swift and decisive action to stop the spread of COVID-19 in the territory. This is not easy, but it is necessary to protect the health and well-being of all Yukoners and maintain the capacity of our healthcare system. It is necessary to protect families, friends, and neighbors right across Yukon. Before I pass off the, uh, the mic off to uh, Dr. Elliott, I need to address some uh, very concerning reports that have been that we've been receiving about the treatment of our frontline healthcare workers in our hospitals, nursing centers, and health facilities across the territory. We have heard that community nurses and other frontline staff are being insulted, verbally abused, even physically abused by individuals that are angry about these new requirements. And there are growing concerns about their safety. This is absolutely unacceptable and it needs to stop. Our territory has a dedicated team of healthcare professionals that have been working flat out for 20 months to help all of us, to help our families, our neighbors, our friends, to stay healthy and safe. These people are our friends, our family, our neighbors. Not very Yukon of us. Each of us, each and every one of our healthcare uh, frontline staff, they deserve respect. They deserve gratitude for their work that they do every day to protect us. If you disagree with the policy, that's fine. Take that up with me. My government is responsible for the decisions that we make to protecting the lives and the livelihood of all Yukoners. Our frontline staff, they're doing their best to support health and well-being of Yukoners. They are heroes. There is no room to disrespect these individuals. They deserve better. We are grappling with the stress of the pandemic, but we all deserve to be treated with kindness and respect. I hear a lot of conversations about civil liberties. The first word is civil. We have a role to play in keeping our communities safe. We need to work together as a territory to increase vaccination rates and to keep each other safe and healthy. Follow the safe six. As I said last week, it's especially important to stay home if you're sick and arrange to get tested. Our government introduced a paid sick leave rebate program at the onset of the pandemic. It's still available to employees and to self-employed individuals as well. Employers uh, can, give, can receive uh, up to 10 days wages if a employee is sick, self-isolating, or caring for kids in the household. You can find details about this program on yukon.ca. We have reopened the drive-through testing facilities as of today to help meet the increased demands for testing. The drive-through facility is open 8.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. That's seven days per week. It will be open tomorrow during Remembrance Day. No appointment is necessary to get tested. Just drive up. The uh, drive through is located at 91628 Alaska Highway at Centennial, at Centennial Motors, uh, and it's in the, uh, the wash bay. As we work to limit transmission, be sure to mask up wherever you go. And please, I'm begging you, get vaccinated. These vaccinations are safe, and they save lives. The vaccine clinic here in Whitehorse is open five days a week. Uh, vaccines are also available in all Yukon communities at your local health center, and you can find more information about the vaccines and how to get your shot by going online at yukon.ca slash this is our shot. These vaccines are safe, they are effective, and they save lives. Increasing our vaccination rate will also lead us out of this pandemic and move us toward that path of recovery. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate your time today. Dr. Elliott.
Thank you, Premier Silver. Good morning, everyone. Bonjour. I'd like to again begin by acknowledging that we're on the traditional territories of the Kwanlin Dun First Nation and the Tan Gwich'in Council, and to thank the people of this land for the stewardship of this beautiful place where we all share and call home. I'll start with an update on the COVID-19 activity in Yukon. Over the pandemic, there have been a total of 1,135 people who have had COVID and 965 people who have recovered from COVID in Yukon. Sadly, 10 Yukoners have died from COVID since the beginning of the pandemic. As of this morning, we have 156 active cases in Yukon. In the past week, we have had seven additional hospitalizations, and there are eight people currently in Yukon hospitals. We've had no medivacs to southern hospitals in the past week. Over this past week, we've seen a sudden and rapid increase in our case counts. The average number of new cases each day has risen from 10 to 30. The percent of cases who are fully vaccinated has increased from June to present and is currently at 50%. While the risk of infection and severe COVID amongst the vaccinated is lower than the unvaccinated, we are seeing cases amongst those who are vaccinated. Test positivity is over 20%, which indicates that there is a lot of undetected infection. We have community spread in Whitehorse and clusters in a number of communities, including Carmax and Watson Lake. I would like to let the people of the communities know where we have active cases. There are two active cases in Carcross. I, I do want to add here that this these numbers reflect people's residential address. And um, so please don't go around <laughs> trying to figure out who's who, unless you're there to support them. And also know that uh, residential address does not necessarily mean people are in those places. Um, so here we go again, case locations. Two active cases in Carcross, 22 active cases in CarMax, two active cases in Dawson City, two in Haynes Junction, one in Mayo, one in Pelly Crossing, 14 cases in Watson Lake, and 108 active cases in Whitehorse. This fall, the Delta variant has changed the picture. This virus is more transmissible. It causes severe COVID in younger adults that is more severe than we saw in previous strains. This is different and it puts our health care system at risk. We are seeing a higher proportion of cases amongst those who are fully vaccinated. Many of our population benefited from the early vaccination program here. This means that now it has been a while since people have had their second doses and it makes sense that their immunity is dipping. What we know from the science is that this waning occurs first in those who are older. These older people are also more at risk for severe COVID. At this time in Yukon, we have a high burden of disease, so people are exposed to more virus. This also contributes to the rates of infection amongst those who are vaccinated. And this is why we have started a vaccine booster program for those who are 50 and older. There will be more opportunities for boosters and expanded recommendations, so please get your booster when your turn comes. Boosters are given when it's more than six months since a person's second dose. This is a challenging time. We are seeing more COVID infections and more severe COVID than any of us had hoped we would see. Our healthcare system is strained but not overwhelmed. This is why we need to take action now. 
In response to this very serious situation, I have recommended that the government make time-limited measures. The situation is serious and significant measures are needed. These measures are needed to curb transmission and prevent a worse toll of serious COVID and protect our healthcare system. These measures will take about two weeks to make a difference and bend the curve. If we follow them, if we do the right thing. We need to do it now and do it well to avoid healthcare overwhelm. Our team has been monitoring the COVID situation and this is why we are requesting this now. We will continue to monitor and will recommend that we remove these measures as soon as it is safe to do so. These measures are needed to protect our healthcare workers. Our healthcare practitioners are working round the clock. Many of these are the same people who have been working tirelessly for the past 20 months of this pandemic. I want to recognize and to thank all of our wonderful nurses, physicians, pharmacists, healthcare practitioners, support staff for their dedication and professional caring over these past weeks and months. I am disheartened to hear that some people have been lashing out with unkind words and actions towards our healthcare staff. This is unacceptable. These are the people who are caring for us. These are the contact tracers, our immunizers, our testers, our nurses, our pharmacists, our lab technicians, all the people who keep the healthcare system running across the territory. These are the people who are working tirelessly to support Yukoners and their families, to support all of us, who are working late nights, over weekends, early in the morning, missing time with their own families. And they're doing this to support ours. To all of these people, I thank you. Your incredible work and dedication has not gone unnoticed, and we could not do this without you. With our rise in case counts, we are pleased to see many people are getting tested. The Premier has just described the efforts that have been made within the government to open a new testing centre that will be open seven days a week and also expand the services at the COVID testing and assessment centre here in Whitehorse. If you live outside Whitehorse, please contact your lo local healthcare centre and book a COVID test if you need one. I know the increased number of cases and exposure notices in schools have caused great concern for our students, parents and staff and their families. I appreciate everyone who has gotten tested or taken their kids to get tested. For those who have taken their kids out of school when they've been sick, even though that's not always easy. And for those teachers, support staff and other staff who have stayed home when they are sick. I understand these are stressful times. We have excellent testing capacity and we have space for all students who need testing. We are looking at all options for testing and we'll do what it takes. We need to balance people's desire for testing with the need to protect our labs and testing space for those who need it. I understand there's a request for rapid testing in schools and I can appreciate that families want to do all they can to protect themselves. For all of those families, there's room for you to get tested at our testing centers and community health centers using high standard and quality tests. Please take the test and keep, your, keep yourself and others safe. With community spread in Whitehorse, anyone who is out and about in Whitehorse should self-monitor for symptoms. And if symptoms arise, isolate yourself away from others and if you need it, to seek testing. For Whitehorse, we will now focus our contact tracing efforts on those people who are most at risk and those who are not eligible to be vaccinated. If you have children in schools or daycares, you can be confident that we will continue to notify parents and caregivers and then post exposures in these settings on yukon.ca. We will also post information about outbreaks. Given that we have community level transmission in Whitehorse, we are now no longer issuing exposure notices for other settings, as we consider all community activities to be a potential source of transmission. 
Flight exposures will continue until November 15th, 2021, at which point they will discontinue as the Public Health Agency of Canada is also ending its COVID-19 flight exposure reporting. Vaccination rates have been rising and this is what is making a difference. We now have more than 90% of those 12 and above with first doses and 86% with second doses. Each person who gets their shot is a person who is more protected, less likely to get infected, to spread the virus and to get severely ill. This is what we need to do now. Over 2,100 people have gotten their booster shot and this is 2,100 Yukoners who have increased their immunity and are protecting us all. The vaccine is safe. The vaccine is effective. The vaccine is good medicine. We are all working hard on developing and um, planning for the time when we can offer vaccine to children in Yukon. And that time is near. Hopefully, we'll have some information from the federal government and NASI by the end of the month. If all goes well and the vaccine is approved. If you are feeling anxious or afraid just now, understand that this is a normal reaction to these times. Please do those things that keep you healthy. Reach out to someone to talk. Get outside and enjoy nature. Look at the beauty of the winter frost and trust that we will get through this together. If you need more support, call 811 and seek mental health support. I want to acknowledge that Monday was a day to honour our First Nations, Inuit and Métis veterans and a time to acknowledge the suffering that many felt due to the policies of the time. Tomorrow is the day to honour all of our veterans for the sacrifices that they made and their dedication in very challenging circumstances. We can learn from their strength and courage and find the strength and courage we need now to do what we need to do. Here are some simple steps that you can take now. First, please get your first dose, your second dose, and your booster dose when it's your turn. If you know someone who's not confident about getting their shot, then please listen kindly to their concerns and help them get the information that they need from their healthcare provider, from 811 or from yukon.ca. These people will also need special protection. They're more vulnerable. So please take care to protect these people from getting infected. Second, please follow the measures to keep us all safe. Wear a mask, keep your safe distance, keep your group sizes small, and bring your proof of vaccination when you are out and about. Take special care with our elders and seniors, those who are immunocompromised and those who are not vaccinated. We need to wrap the blankets of protection around these people now. Third, get your flu shot because it stops transmission of flu. It protects those people who are most vulnerable, those elders, those with chronic disease, and those who are pregnant. Fourth, as you make your plans for the coming holidays, plan for small gatherings and gather with those who are vaccinated. With the measures we have now, we hope that we will be able to reduce the measures by the time the winter holidays come. Nonetheless, we will still be in a pandemic and we will need to be cautious. Please do these things with grace and with kindness and knowing that you are helping yourself, your loved ones, and particularly helping everyone who may need health care over the coming weeks. Shoni Tan, Gunalchish, Masi Cho, thank you, merci. Thank you, Premier Silver, and thank you, Dr. Elliott. We will now move on to the question and answer se session with media. A reminder to reporters, please identify which speaker you would like to answer your question before you start, and please also remember to mute and unmute yourselves. As there are no reporters in the room, we will go to the phone lines. 
And we will start with Dirk at the Canadian Press. Hi, Ed. This is for the uh, Premier. Um, can you um, elaborate a bit more on how you think uh, how Whitehorse got to this situation where you're now um, impo- or declaring a state of emergency? Yeah, I think as we identified early with forging for, uh, ahead uh, our document for the new normal <clears throat> um, this summer, we, we knew that we need to be prepared for outbreaks. You know, with a small uh, jurisdiction, small populations, that comes with, uh, you know, smaller numbers of, uh, of emergency beds, those types of things. So uh, we've, we also knew uh, when we led Canada back uh, uh, early, early summer in vaccinations, and we saw an outbreak at that time as well, we knew uh, that with pockets of, communi- of the community, with, uh, you know, even having large rates of vaccination, we're still going to have areas, uh, demographics that are low in, in, in those uh, vaccines, uh, in, the, in vaccination. So, uh, you know, being able to predict when it's going to happen is not something that any jurisdiction can do, but being prepared for the inevitable is something that we put a lot of time and energy into. So uh, over the weekend, seeing numbers increase, uh, and, uh, you know, it was a long weekend, that's for sure. Uh, of efforts with everybody, um, but uh, knowing that uh, this was the inevitability really helped uh, the, the professionalism of our health and social services departments and teams and the Chief Medical Officer of Health and her team um, allows us to move very, very quickly when these types of outbreaks uh, exist. Do you have a follow-up, Dirk? Yes, uh, I'd, I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Elliot if she could also uh, uh, elaborate a bit more on um, the um, the vaccine, and it's, you're suggesting that it that it's uh, waning for for people who have been double vaxxed. There are a number of reasons who are people who have had two doses of vaccine are getting ill uh, and getting infected. The most important thing to know is that the vaccine reduces your risk of infection, and it reduces the risk of severe illness and death should you become infected. What we are seeing now in terms of these infections has to do with a number of factors. One of the factors is that we have more COVID circulating in the community and therefore we are all more exposed to COVID than we've been in the past. The highest exposures occur in close quarters with high respiration rates. So if people are breathing quickly, it's the time to have more space. Another contributor is, for many people, it's been a long time since they had their second dose. It is normal for vaccine immunity to wane over time. And many people know that children, for example, have five different times when they get various vaccines uh, up to kindergarten. This is to boost the immune system. This is the medicine that teaches our immune system to react quickly and effectively should we become infected. Because we are seeing uh, that there's, a, there's some waning in this immunity, and that is what it looks like at this point, to the best of our knowledge, in addition to the fact that we're all exposed a little bit more, uh, we are offering boosters to those who are 50 and older who are most at risk of severe disease, and we're among those who were first vaccinated. This is something that's occurring across Canada, and we're watching closely and we will move uh, and increase the vaccine booster program when the time is right. I'm urging everyone to get their booster dose if you're eligible and when it's your turn. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now move to John at CKRW. Hi, um, my question is directed towards uh, Dr. Elliot. Um, it was mentioned that rapid testing would be explored for schools. I just want to know what, what goes into that exploration. Uh, what exactly is uh, your office doing to, to figure out whether or not rapid testing should be put into schools? Thank you for this question. I know many parents and teachers and students are concerned about COVID-19 in schools. And I know uh, one of the tools that people are asking for is rapid testing. The first thing I need to say is we do use rapid testing in Yukon. We have the rapid PCR testing, which is the Abbott ID now, which is used throughout Yukon, where and when it is necessary in order to help people 
have a rapid result. We also have uh, gold standard testing at the Whitehorse General Hospital is where the, the lab that conducts the testing with swabbing and sample collection all over the Yukon, as well as at the BCCDC. I must admit I've had to ask myself, why would people want a lower quality test uh, when we have such a strong and high quality testing system? As a, as a human, as a parent, I understand uh, that we want answers and uh, we want to be sure that we're keeping everybody safe. As a doctor, I too want to be sure that we're keeping everybody safe as best we can. We are looking at rapid testing. It's been used in many rapid home testing, I think is uh, what's uh, being asked. It's being used uh, throughout uh, Canada in various places to greater or lesser extent. Um, we have used rapid antigen testing in uh, times of very high prevalence where we need to test a lot of people quickly and we don't have the capacity uh, to have those appointments available. Um, the other thing is that Health Canada is working rapidly to uh, license home testing uh, throughout uh, Canada and we are optimistic that these sort of test kits will be offered not just uh, you know, wherever we can get anything, but also in our own pharmacies here uh, in the near future. Because of the demand and the concern, we're looking at what the role might be of home testing uh, in Yukon. And, uh, and so this is what we are looking at at this point in terms of will people uh, still stay on isolation if they test negative? Uh, these are the questions for you. If you test negative in the morning, will you still isolate all day? Because you might be infected, but the virus might be low. It might increase at noon or at 6 p.m. when you're out and about. Will you still isolate? If you have a rapid test, will you do a proper sample? It's not very comfortable. That's what you need to do, and I think many people will do that. Um, if you have a rapid test, will you still follow the guidance of the health professionals or will you make your own choices based on what you read somewhere else? I, I think where, we, where and when we need rapid home testing, we will have it. I also want to urge those people who are, are just uh, really want to get tested uh, to reassure themselves or for other reasons to know that there is a private testing clinic uh, in Whitehorse and, um, and you can seek that out if that's something that you're interested at this time. We have a high quality lab system, we have a high quality sample collection system and we have a high quality testing system. We are expanding this system to meet the demand and we do not want to overwhelm the system by having extra tests for those who are not needing it to know what the proper um, ways to keep us safe is. Uh, if we overwhelm the system, we will see that uh, people who are sick won't have access to testing like they do now. So these are all the things that are coming into consideration. The quality of the tests, the capacity of the testing system, ensuring everybody has the tests they need when they need it, and, um, and trusting that people will do the right thing. Thank you. Thank you. John, do you have a follow-up question? I do. Uh, this one is directed uh, for the Premier. Um, Mr. Silver, uh, I I'm just wondering if there's anything you can say to the public in regards to why they should trust the Yukon government on this, seeing as the COVID-19 response has been a little bit lacking in the past few weeks to even months. It, the government's really dragged its feet on, on getting on top of these outbreaks. Uh, what do you have to say to that? Uh, I'd say that over the last 20 months, we've been uh, using the exact same uh, modus operandi, uh, which is to follow the recommendations from the CMOH. Uh, we saw a rolling average of 10 cases per day increase over overnight on the weekend, and we're reacting. Thank you. We will now go to Tim at the Whitehorse Star. Good morning. Can you hear me? We can, Tim. Thank you. Okay. So uh, my first question is probably uh, for the Premier, just referring back to uh, the, the suggestion that there's uh, some abuse happening of frontline officials. Uh, can you give us an example of something more concrete, how many of these things are going on in some more details on what's happening? 
I, I think I'm comfortable with my statement so far, um, as opposed to focusing my ire on uh, some individuals who are doing things that are just really not indicative of what it means to be a Yukoner. I want my uh, comments also to focus in on uh, how important and valuable the services that are being provided by the frontline workers are. I mean what I say, these people are heroes. They need to be treated that way. Thank you. Tim, do you have a follow-up question? Yes, the uh, next one would be for Dr. Elliott. Uh, can we expect to see uh, these booster shots every, say, six to eight months? Is uh, that there our immediate future? I think it was a few uh, press conferences ago I said, um, if I could predict the future, I'd be a different sort of person and not a human person. <laughs> This is, uh, these are um, things that we are learning as we go through this pandemic. Um, what we know now is based on how long we've had this vaccine and all of the millions of doses that have been given out around the world and the, the close scrutiny and careful examination of the evidence. Um, what I can tell you is what we know now, and that's that uh, people will... Uh, People who are 50 and older are encouraged to get a booster. Uh, we are seeing signs that people who are vaccinated are getting infected, uh, and the, the shots are still protecting us from uh, severe outcomes, from hospitalization and death. Um, and uh, what the booster does is it helps your body remember um, how to, uh, to fight this, vac this uh, virus when it enters the body and it gives your body the medicine it needs to react quickly so uh, you don't get sick. Um, will we see more boosters, uh, you know, uh, 12 months after the first series or 18 months after the first series or every five years? Uh, I think we need to wait 12 months or 18 years uh, and, and watch uh, what's been happening, uh, uh, what ha will happen in the science, um, what sort of variants we have at that point. Um, what, how we've learned to adapt our society to reduce infection, and all of these things uh, we will know when the time comes. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now move to Haley with Yukon News. Thank you. Uh, my first question would be for Dr. Elliott. I know when it comes to um, the different mandates and decisions, it's, it's a balancing act between personal freedoms and, and health. Um, I think a lot of people are feeling a little scared, maybe, of their recent spike in cases. And I was wondering if you could explain sort of how we went from very few restrictions to um, a state of emergency. Did you consider implementing um, some lighter restrictions before we got to this point? Why or why not? That kind of thing. Um. A lot of people wonder why, how, why and how we're here now. Uh, uh, many people don't want to be here now. I would count myself among them. How, how did we get here? Um, I, I think I've been over a few things, as I spoke earlier. We have a more transmissible virus uh, that's causing uh, severe illness amongst younger people, uh, young adults. We haven't seen that in the past. Um, we, it's winter, people are moving indoors, uh, and um, people are having a large number of contacts because these healthy relationships and contacts are the things that uh, help keep us healthy and going. Um, for for uh, well over a month, I've been recommending that people wear masks in indoor spaces and um, and uh, people, particularly, particularly those who are most vulnerable, including the unvaccinated, keep their group sizes small. It, here in Yukon, and uh, if you look across the, the country, in many places across the country, um, there's been a sudden and rapid increase over a very short period of time. And now is the time to act. And this is why we need the legal lever on top of the recommendation at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Haley, do you have a follow-up question? Um, I do, yeah. My second question was about um, that testing availability, and I was wondering if you can give us an idea of what the turnaround time is for tests right now, mm -hmm. and um, whether we should be concerned about our testing capacity being overwhelmed. Uh, so, 
I do follow the turnaround time for testing. I don't actually have today's number in front of me right now. Um, it has been sticking pretty closely around that uh, um, 36 to 48 hour mark. Um, we are not concerned about our testing capacity at this point. We are expanding our testing capacity to meet the need that exists. Uh, we are watching it closely. Uh, we will continue to do that and to, uh, to get the tests that people need when they need it. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now move to John, Yukon Sports Report. Hi, my question is for Dr. Elliott. Um, so as, as part of the state of emergency activities between schools are suspended until further notice, um, which is notably all the, the high school volleyball um, this semester and then basketball next semester. Um, and, I mean, obviously, I think it's come up before in the past, but people are sort of questioning why the school sports are being suspended, but, you know, club sports and recreational sports are being allowed to continue. Can you just sort of um, elaborate maybe on what the distinction is being made there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, school sports are a really important part of health and well-being in schools, um, and they're something that um, many uh, young people train for, work hard for, and look forward to. Um, and there are a lot of positive physical and mental health benefits of school sports. The uh, recommendation to uh, suspend uh, sports between schools is a short-lived temporary measure that we are using to reduce group sizes and contact sizes and mixing uh, in, in, the, in, our, um, in our community. Uh, and this is a, a short-lived measure. Uh, people, young people are still uh, encouraged strongly to train, uh, to work hard with their, with their teammates, um, to play scrimmages and, and uh, among, um, games uh, within their schools. Um, I think many of them will know that the Olympic athletes that went to the Olympics in Japan this summer, many of them trained at home and, and saw their coaches through Zoom. Uh, and, and struggled in some of the same ways that, that you will struggle now for, the, for this short-lived time. I'm hoping that we'll be able to um, get these things back and going uh, as soon as possible and, uh, and we'll keep monitoring and working on it. Um, the question about um, activities, uh, other activities that are not suspended, um, I think people will find that there are um, We've done the best we can to keep things going uh, while reducing the risk. And uh, for, for many sports and clubs, um, this uh, means uh, proof of vaccination. Either they've opted for themselves or because of the age of the participants, um, they, will, they will need to do this. Um, and, uh, and we've also uh, recommended another, a number of other measures in terms of group sizes, capacity limits, and other things to keep those things going. It really is a balance and um, I'm sure any of us if we stay up late at night and look in all the weeds and nitty gritty can find inconsistencies um, and, uh, and I, that's true in all areas of life. The, the important thing now is to do what we need to do to keep our group sizes small, keep our contacts few, keep ourselves safe, uh, wear your mask, keep your distance, get your vaccine and put that blanket around those who are most vulnerable including the elders and seniors, immunocompromised, and those who are not vaccinated. Thank you. Thank you. John, do you have a follow-up question? Uh, no, I don't. Thanks very much. Thank you, John. We'll now move to Vincent at Radio Canada. Oui, bonjour. Dr. Ayat, une question en français, s'il vous plaît. Et ce sont les mesures mises en place les plus restrictives, du moins pour les rassemblements personnels, depuis le début de la pandémie, malgré un taux de vaccination très haut. Uh, Pouvez-vous expliquer comment on en est arrivé là, selon vous, et qu'est-ce qui vous a poussé à, à mettre en place ces restrictions? So, Dr. Elliott, can you uh, please tell us in French uh, why we are now in mo uh, some of the most restrictive measures that we have seen in a few months, and uh, what is being, uh, what uh, measures are being taken right now to make sure that we can have a way out of this situation? Uh, merci pour la question. Um, ce qui est arrivé uh, la semaine uh, passée, c'est que uh, le taux de cas et le, um, le um, agrandissement du nombre de cas à, à les deux sont uh, 
sont plus haut maintenant qu'ils qu seraient il y a une semaine. So, euh, les cas ont euh, euh, été euh, dits euh, par jour euh, il y a une semaine et, et sont 30 maintenant. La euh, positivité des tests, euh, c'est 20 maintenant. Um, les deux choses ensemble indiquent qu'il y a beaucoup d'infections, il y a beaucoup d'infections qu'on n'a pas uh, détectées et, um, et le risque d'être infecté à Whitehorse uh, est, um, est, um, est, est dans la communauté. À cause de ça, uh, uh, ça c'est une uh, situation sérieuse. Um, uh, il y a plusieurs de, uh, gens à l'hôpital um, qu'on avait euh, euh, il y a une semaine, il y a un mois, euh, jusqu'à juin. Euh, alors, c'est vraiment sérieux et euh, c'est à cause de ça que j'ai recommandé au gouvernement du Grand pour ces mesures qui sont euh, pour euh, un temps euh, de duration limitée euh, et qui sont sérieux aussi. Euh, il y a des gens qui se demandent pourquoi est-ce qu'on est maintenant dans cette situation, même parce qu'on a 90 des gens qui sont éligibles, qui ont pris leur vaccin premier et 86 qui ont pris leur vaccin deuxième. Et il y a plus que 2000 personnes qui ont leur, leur troisième booster vaccine. Il uh, n'y a personne qui a voulu être ici maintenant uh, uh, et, um, et ça, c'est uh, une situation grave et sérieuse. Um, on est arrivé uh, là parce qu'on a ce uh, nouveau uh, variant de, de COVID-19, le Delta, qui est plus uh, communicable et uh, qui est aussi uh, plus grave, uh, uh, notamment pour les gens qui sont des adultes jeunes Uh, qui devient, um, qui arrive à, à l'hôpital même uh, um, plusieurs, uh, uh, beaucoup plus risque uh, ceux qui ne sont pas vaccinés, uh, ceux qui sont enceintes. Et, um, et aussi, uh, il y a du risque uh, pour ceux qui sont vaccinés, mais c'est beaucoup plus moins. Um, avec ce nouveau um, variant, c'est plus difficile um, de, de contrôler ce, ce, uh, la transmission. Um, c'est um, avec uh, un, un virus um, qui a uh, le R de 5, uh, c'est à peu près ça pour uh, le COVID-19. Um, il faut avoir uh, plusieurs du monde uh, dans la population qui, sont, uh, uh, qui ont l'immunité uh, uh, qui, qui, uh, 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 pour um, arrêter la transmission de l'un à l'autre. Au futur, on voit que... Um, on va avoir plusieurs de gens qui ont leur, euh, leur euh, vaccin premier et, et, euh, et le deuxième, qui ont leur booster. Et on verra euh, peut-être euh, même euh, au fin du mois qu'on qu euh, qu va avoir euh, les vaccins pour les jeunes, les, les jeunes qui sont euh, moins de 11 ans. Et, euh, et ça, ça ça devient un temps où on peut uh, leur protéger aussi. Um, C'est toutes ces choses qu'il faut faire uh, et, et on est préparé à faire ça uh, pendant uh, les mois, uh, les jours, les semaines, les mois prochains. Et maintenant, uh, on utilise les outils qu'on a et ça, c'est les, uh, les outils qui... Uh, um, qui, euh, pour qu'on arrive à avoir euh, moins de contacts euh, euh, pour chaque personne et qui protège ceux qui sont plus vulnérables euh, pour, euh, pour euh, malade, les maladies graves. Ça, c'est euh, ceux qui sont plus âgés, euh, ceux qui ont les, euh, les maladies chroniques et euh, les gens qui ne sont pas vaccinés. Merci. Thank you. Une autre question, Vincent? Oui, merci. Euh, juste encore, Dr. Elliott, pour répondre aux inquiétudes des parents, est-ce que vous pouvez nous, nous dire ce que vous pensez, à répéter ce que vous avez dit en anglais, sur euh, les tests rapides mis en place dans les écoles? So, Dr. Elliott, to answer the concerns of parents, can you please repeat in French what you have said about the rapid testing for the schools? Oh, oui. Um, 
Euh, on voit beaucoup de cas euh, dans les écoles. Euh, je vous dis premièrement que les cas à l'école, ça indique euh, l'activité du virus dans la communauté. Euh, à ce moment-là, les, les jeunes qui sont malades n'ont pas euh, la chance d'être à l'école et euh, ils, ils deviennent testés et puis euh, on leur diagnose euh, avec le COVID-19. Euh, on n'a pas vu euh, beaucoup de transmission dans les écoles. On a des plans, on a des, euh, des mesures dans les écoles qui sont plus strictes que dans l'autre part de la société. Et euh, maintenant, les jeunes euh, étudiantes euh, portent les masques euh, dans leur classe et euh, quand ils sont même euh, assis euh, euh, aux tables. Euh, mais aussi, ce n'est euh, pas une surprise que les, les parents, les administrateurs euh, veulent euh, protéger les jeunes et les écoles euh, euh, avec tous les outils qu'on a. Euh, et euh, un outil qu'il euh, se propose, c'est euh, que les, les parents, les familles proposent, euh, c'est euh, les tests euh, rapides. D'abord, je veux dire qu'on a les tests rapides ici à Yukon, on les utilise. On a le um, test um, PCR uh, rapide, uh, le Abbott ID Now, qu'on utilise um, dans le um, centre de uh, test uh, à Whitehorse et uh, beaucoup d'autres endroits uh, uh, dans le territoire. Et uh, ça, c'est un test rapide de, de très haute qualité. On a aussi des uh, laboratoires um, en Colombie-Britannique et uh, dans notre hôpital ici à Whitehorse qui ont les, um, les tests uh, du standard or uh, pour uh, le diagnose. Alors, uh, et on a aussi beaucoup d'opportunités um, uh, d'avoir être uh, uh, testé. Uh, même on a on arrive aujourd'hui à ouvrir le, le centre de test à conduire. Ce n'est pas pour apprendre à conduire, c'est on peut conduire là et, et prendre ton test. Et alors, je me demande pourquoi les gens, les, les gens demandent un test qui est de, de pire qualité de notre système. Mais aussi, comme je suis un parent, je comprends qu'on veut être rassuré euh, qu'on n'a pas euh, cette maladie euh, et on veut être assuré qu'on ne euh, introduise, euh, introduit pas la, cette maladie aller aux écoles. Euh, C'est à cause de ça qu'on examine encore euh, le, le, s'il y a une place ici au Yukon pour les tests rapides à la maison. Et... Euh, et euh, c'est ça qu'on euh, qu est en train de, de voir maintenant. Il y a euh, euh, peut-être euh, les, euh, les avantages de voir ces tests, mais il y a aussi des, des avantages. Et ce qu'on a, on a des concerns, c'est euh, d'avoir un une système euh, pour les gens qui n'ont pas de bons... Euh, Um, conseil après un test, uh, même uh, uh, il y a des gens qui pensent qu'on a, si on a un test rapide, uh, même si le uh, uh, YCDC a dit uh, vous, vous sera en isolation, et, ils pensent qu'ils peuvent uh, arrêter cette isolation. Ce n'est pas comme ça, parce qu'on sait qu'on a le virus dans notre corps, ce n'est pas toujours détecté par les tests, uh, uh, qu'on sait uh, un petit peu, et... Um, Uh, plusieurs, il, y a, il passe des heures ou bien des, des, um, des jours et, et on, a, on, peut être, on peut infecter des gens. C'est pour ça qu'on a les isolations. Alors, um, uh, l'autre concern, c'est que les laboratoires uh, peuvent être um, uh, pas capables de, de faire les tests qui sont plus importants. C'est ces choses que uh, le demande et aussi uh, ces risques qu'on uh, examine maintenant et uh, on, on arrive à une, une solution. Merci. Merci. We'll now move to the final reporter we have on the line here, Anna at CBC. Thank you. So my first question is for Premier Sandy Silver. I'm just wondering what happens when someone, if they decide not to comply with the new emergency, state of emergency, uh, what kind of enforcement the territory is going to have in place for those that do not comply? Thank you. Yeah, we have... Um under the Civil Emergency Measures Act, we have provisions for uh, for enforcement. Um, we all, uh, so 
being in that state of emergency, we have that authority uh, under that act. Um, there is other authorities as well under the uh, the, uh, the other acts uh, uh, as well, Public Health Safety Act. Um, but yes, we we are now standing up, almost similar. If you're paying attention to what we were doing this summer when the uh, when we end. In the previous year, when we had SEMA uh, in enforcement officers out, uh, we've uh, taken uh, folks that are certified from uh, Energy Mines and Resources, our, uh, our Department of uh, uh, Liquor Department as well. Um, so it'll be the same model where we have those individuals that have substantive uh, roles uh, doing the enforcement. But again, there's two different acts in which restrictions could be, uh, uh, could be adhered to. Thank you. Anna, do you have another question? I do, yeah. This question is for Dr. Elliott. So the list of designated areas came out this morning, and on that list it says that proof of vaccination is not acquired for essential services like healthcare, grocery stores, banks, et cetera. So how did um, your department or you personally come up with the recommendations of which areas you need to show proof of vaccination and which ones you do not? Thank you. Uh, I think... Um you know, we need to strike a balance uh, with these policies um, in keeping people safe and healthy and also ensuring that those people who are not um, ready to get vaccinated have access to the things they need and have uh, um, other tools to support themselves uh, and, and uh, function um, in, uh, in the ways um, that are important. Um, Unvaccinated people will be able to access all health care uh, and all important services such as drugstores, uh, getting groceries, etc. Nonetheless, um, it is still also important that uh, we reduce the risk for everybody, including those unvaccinated people, by uh, reducing um, the capacity of the virus to spread um, throughout our society and uh, and therefore there are some areas where proof of vaccination will be required. Um, these include restaurants, um, certain non-essential types of retail and other other places. Um, these are the considerations that we've we've made. Um, so for example, um, people need to access um, a daycare and they have to walk through a, a place where proof of vaccination is required to access that daycare, uh, provisions will be made for these things. Um, uh, uh, so it's really striking uh, the balance and ensuring that we, um, uh, people who are not um, yet there uh, with vaccination are able to access what they need and, and have um, those blankets of protection uh, as well for them and for the rest of uh, Yukoners. Thank you. Thank you. That now concludes our COVID-19 update. Stay tuned for our next COVID-19 update next week. Thank you again to Premier Silver, and thank you to Dr. Elliott. Thank you also to all the media on the line and everyone who tuned in to watch live on Facebook. Stay safe and stay kind, everyone.